Jason Benison and Fred Zmaler. Uh, well, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, vaccines lately. And last week I uh, talked about, or two weeks ago, I talked about the vaccine, the shingles, preventing uh, cardiovascular disease and dementia, or at least having a big impact. And uh, more and more data is coming out on the benefits of the vaccines for COVID. And the reason you go like, well, why now? Well, in a, in a study looking at cardiovascular outcomes or risk factors, it takes three or four or five years before you see the events. And so you wouldn't be able to detect them until about now. So now there's some studies coming out showing additional benefits to vaccination beyond just preventing uh, the infection. And this is in the context of increasing uh, hes vaccine hesitancy. So this is a graph that shows general trends in vaccine hesitancy. You know, we're for measles in particular, you know, the country's got to be 95% vaccinated. You can already see by 2015, it's around 93%. And slowly but surely, we now have 25% of the country that is hesitant about getting vaccines. And there continues to be additional decline in support for mandatory childhood vaccines. It used to be 82% in 2019, it's down to 70% in 2023. And you're seeing that all over the country which is why we're going to continue to see multiple outbreaks. So I thought today would be really good opportunity to talk about all of the additional benefits to the vaccine that really we didn't anticipate. So there's a really interesting single study from the American Heart Association from the Cleveland Clinic and University of Southern California that looked at the data from the UK Biobank. It took 10,000 people who were COVID positive by PCR and compared that to 217,000 patients who served as controls in the UK Biobank. And what they showed was that the effect for serious outcomes like myocardial infarction, stroke, or death across all of the levels, COVID-19 uh, uh, cases, if you were vaccinated, were much better. If you were hospitalized, in addition to that, um, the non-O blood groups had an additional uh, risk of, of clotting, so having vascular clots. But I want to show you the data because it's really impressive. The two black lines here represent people who don't have cardiovascular disease. So the dotted line here is no cardiovascular disease and not infected with COVID. And this is over time up to three years after the event. And you see severe cardiovascular outcomes, myocardial infarction, stroke, and death. And so you can see in people who don't have COVID or don't have cardiovascular disease, obviously it's minimal risk. It goes up over time, obviously, as you get older. And in people who do have cardiovascular risk factors, it's higher. And you can see these both black lines are not with COVID. But the real fascinating thing is to look at this red dotted line. That is uh, no cardiovascular risk, but just COVID positive. That adds a risk just as though, like you had cardiovascular disease. And this is what people are beginning to realize. Having COVID within the three-year window was as risky as having a serious risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, if you had both COVID and cardiovascular disease, look at the risk. It went up to 40 to 50 percent. Now, we didn't recognize that right away because it took a couple of years to develop. So think about 20 to 22. Now it's 25. Now we're seeing these, these dramatic changes. <laughs> and of course, I like the way sometimes in order to make a point, they'll make, do a diagram. <laughs> so this is the diagram they wanted to illustrate the point. Here's SARS infection that caused you to go to the hospital. And if you have one of the AB or AB blood groups, you, thrombosis, and of course, <laughs> they have a rest in peace. <laughs> oh my, anyway, it illustrates the point. So here's a, you know, that was one study. So let's look at a meta-analysis. This is uh, these authors that published in the Journal of the American Heart Association, looked at 155 studies, and they found that either influenza or COVID inf infection uh, raised the risk of heart attack or stroke by three to five-fold um, within the weeks following infection. So this is a classic example of uh, risk from infection. If you're vaccinated, it highly reduces the risk. Uh, and another reason why vaccines are important, independent when you just think about not getting the disease, it's pr protective against uh, some of the cardiovascular outcomes. And then in children, uh, the issue really has been long COVID. And there are plenty of studies that show that long COVID can be prevented by vaccination in adults. So this is a study to look at adolescents, 12 to 17 years old. They looked at 60 healthcare and community settings, looked at 724 vaccinated adolescents and compared them to 507 unvaccinated. 
And there was a 36% lower chance of having long COVID if you were vaccinated. So obviously, many examples of where vaccination is having a big impact beyond just preventing you from having the disease. So as a parent or an adult, when you start thinking about these, you've got to weigh, as an adult, the risk factors that you have, not to mention uh, the impact on your children. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of vaccines that somehow, um, you know, the vaccine itself was worse than the disease. I've heard that, which is ridiculous, but I've heard it. So this was a study looking at severe vascular inflammatory disease after COVID in 14 million children in England. And they mostly looked at the inflammatory responses, blood clots, and, and also the myocarditis, myocarditis that was, uh, you know, sometimes associated with the vaccine. And what they found is that 28% of the kids that got COVID uh, had one of these inflammatory responses, and there was a significant reduction in those people who, who were vaccinated. And the vaccine itself caused it in a very rare number of cases. So another example where the vaccine does cause a little bit of a problem, but it's much worse. The disease itself called, caused much more myocarditis and inflammatory response than the vaccine. Okay, enough of that. Uh, I'd love to stop talking about measles. I'm sick of measles, but we keep having outbreaks. So right now the hot spots are Utah and South Carolina, 64 cases in Utah, 37 cases in uh, South Carolina. Israel has had 1,700 cases, and you know, so we keep, we keep adding on, and we'll always do that as long as our vaccine uh, number of people are vaccinated is under 95 percent. We're going to have outbreaks every time there's in measles introduced in the community. We're up to 1,681 cases. Uh, think about that. And we were measles free just you know 10 years ago. Well, not quite, 15 years ago, and of course. Thank God for our neighbors in Canada. There have 5,000 cases. They used to be a, a considered a measles-free country. <laughs> Not anymore. They have 5,000 cases, way more than ours. And just to, to be a, a measles-free country, you have to have no cases in 12 months. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. Anyway, with uh, Thanksgiving coming up, just in time to have bird flu infecting the th <laughs> all of our turkey <laughs> flocks. And yes, of course, you, you know, you just can't make it up. You know this is going to happen. The migratory birds are flying around, and, uh, you know, on the pathways we've talked about. And so far, there have been 32 commercial flocks and 35 backyard flocks infected, over 3.72 million uh, birds. And in Michigan, 113,000 birds were affected in an outbreak on a turkey farm. In Indiana, in case you don't do turkey for Thanksgiving, you do duck. Indiana reported 21,000 birds in a duck breeding facility infected by Oh, man. <laughs> We're going to have nothing to eat on Thanksgiving. Uh, anyway, so as a result, so this is fascinating. The U.S. turkey flock is at its smallest in 40 years. Wholesale turkey prices are 40% higher than last year. And according to the USDA, nearly 514,000 turkeys have been uh, infected by bird flu. Now, here's my favorite thing. I did not know. Billy, did you know this? I did not know that there was a National Turkey Federation. <laughs> There is, an, and they want to reassure the public. They're reassuring the public that there'll be enough turkeys for Thanksgiving, and then they said, though supply could tighten for fresh or specific sized birds if the cases continue to rise. So, so that means, I, I interpret that to mean, you should be able to get a frozen one pound turkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Just, yeah. hey, I'm gonna end today. But the Teffy data, I always like to see the Teffy data. There's some good news here. The good news is SARS is not around. So, you know, we've had enough vaccinations. It looks like SARS, it, it's, it's present, but not uh, spiking in Texas. All the usual respiratory viruses are adenovirus, enterovirus 68, norovirus, parvo a little bit, and of course, MPOX is still around in Austin and Houston. Anyway. I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to Beacon Boskert, the Senior Dean of Faculty and Director of the Winders Center of Heart Failure, was named the American Heart Association 2025 Lynette Clinician Educator Lecturer in recognition for her work and leadership in heart failure. And this lecture was established in 1970 by the Lynette Society to promote the importance of bedside cardiology uh, and the application of clinical research to the bedside. A uh, big shout out to Dr. David Allison, director of the Children's Nutrition Center, who received the 2025 Irving S. Wright Award of Distinction from the American Federation for Aging Research. 
Uh, this uh, award recognizes contributions to basic or clinical research in, in the field of aging. Congratulations to uh, Dr. Bose Hamill, Professor of Ophthalmology, who was named the inaugural holder of the Hamill Foundation Chair in Ophthalmology Research, and this was established through the generosity uh, of, the, of the Hamill Foundation. And today I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, that our Chancellor Bert O'Malley passed away. Bert was a leader and mentor of many, many um, Baylor faculty and st staff and students and internationally uh, for, for, for over five decades. He was recognized for his, his uh, pioneering research uh, in molecular endocrinology. He was a fantastic scientist, a wonderful mentor, legend here at, at Baylor, and he'll be greatly missed and our deepest condolences to his family. Anyway, have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you next week. I have to say, be happy with where you are and what you've done and uh, what you've accomplished and um, give the appropriate thanks to the good Lord, your family and your colleagues and co-workers because they all share in that.